Hi there. Jersey Joe's cartoonist and teaching artist. All the links are right above me. And it is Monday, March 22nd, 2021. 10 a.m. Eastern Time, 9 a.m. Central Time, 7 a.m. Pacific Time, which means it's time for me to do another drawing live stream. What are we drawing? What am I, we drawing? What am I drawing? Um, this, it is a piece of, uh, just an illustration of some characters I've been playing with for a long time now. Uh, Baron Von Bear, Pickles and Taft, and jumping off a bridge that is getting exploded by wizard lightning. Uh, I actually have, I penciled it in Clip Studio Paint, which you can see there. I uh, did this Saturday night just as like a cool down drawing. Spent about an hour on it. And now I'm going to see if I can ink it in an hour or so. And what tools are you using, Jersey? Well, using a couple of brush pens. What are these? These Pentel uh, color brushes, essentially. And then a couple of felt tips. What do we got? A 0.7 and a 0.3 Stadler. And then in case I make any egregious errors, I've got my Uniball Cyano white pen. I'm going to try not to use this, though, because when I finish inking this, I want to try to watercolor it, too. So time to dive in and do it. Now, back in the old days when I did all my art on the boards, I do a combination now. Which do you prefer, Jersey? Digital or, or working on paper? I like them both for different reasons. But there was a time when I did when I exclusively drew all my comics on Bristol board. And when I did that, I always liked to start with the background elements, the things that I did with like my back then, what did I use? I used a Koinur repitographs. And I remember saying that I liked doing it that way. I like to start with background elements because it always felt a little bit more mechanical and I didn't have to uh, worry about line value quite as much the way I do when I do like some of these elements. And it was like a way to warm up my hand because I didn't do a warm up drawing today. I just came down here into the studio and just turned on the cameras. Should I zoom in? Maybe I should zoom in. Just have to make sure that I'm being extra careful to keep my art in the shot. So what I've been doing with these drawings that I've been live streaming is I've really been just, this is sort of like, I would say sketchbook work. Where I'm just trying to draw the characters interacting in a lot of different places and environments. This was one from a, what, like a week or two ago. And I'm trying to show them, I think I, sh I did one where they're around a campfire and preparing food. I'm also trying to, I have to turn this upside down. I'm also trying to draw them doing exciting action-y things, too, because that's my favorite thing to draw. But I don't want to just stick exclusively to that. I want to try, like, a variety of tones. What's going on there? What did I do? What are you? Look at the digital version. Zoom in and see what I was drawing there. That's just a straight up goof. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Uh, yeah, I, I think that... It came out okay, given that I was really trying to rush through it. I was just trying to think of, like, okay, the bridge from Stand By Me, the train bridge, and then everybody's jumping off as it's getting blasted, and I wanted to do, yeah, some forced perspective stuff with, like, the, the lightning blast has come, like, right from over our shoulder and then nailing the far distance. That was the intention there. The 
The other thing I'm trying to learn here is what is the limit on detail when I'm doing these drawings. And what I mean by that is I learned with this drawing was, yeah, this took a long time and I'm not sure that I pulled it off in terms of value and perspective. I feel like this stuff in the background either needs to be darker or way lighter. Um, I didn't quite nail the depth that I was going for. And I think also I just, I just had too many darn, I was coloring these things individually too much, I think. So I'm trying to like do something that's in between that and just the characters standing around. Where did that line go? That part of the, man, I, I really did. I, I was I was watching TV while I did this drawing. <laughs> I didn't quite get all my details straightened out right. <laughs> okay. So now I'm gonna switch to working with the brush pen here. Reason being is that this part of I'm gonna get all philosophical about it. This part of the drawing, this part of the bridge is in motion, being blasted by the explosion that's ripping this bit apart. So I want the lines to feel more alive. I might need to unzoom this. Well, I think you're fine where you are. I'm trying to get papers kind of like hitting the uh, tripod that this camera's on. I need to research a new solution because, yeah, I can't turn my paper all the way around the way I would like and keep the paper or the image in the viewing range of the camera. I'm going to get a dry brush for some of that stuff in a second.
am I doing on time? I've gone 10 minutes. Okay. I was worried that this might not take me a full hour to ink. It might. It might at that. A contingency plan was... Oh. How on 15 FE? I just can't draw standing up. I don't know if I if I ever draw standing up that often. Or do you mean you can't draw people standing up? My guess is you mean you can't draw while you're standing. You see those people doing those plein air drawing th sessions where they're like standing with like a little uh, easel in front of them. Uh, yeah, I never learned how to do that, how to actually like work with a easel in, like almost vertically in front of you and then standing up and like doing a painting like that. I never learned how to do that. So I'm with you there. I usually have to be on a uh, horizontal surface or have my paper on a horizontal surface. And usually, yeah, I like to sit. Almost done with the bridge. Have you found yourself in a situation, uh, Powin 15 FE, where you needed to draw standing up? Was somebody asking you to? How did this come about where you discovered that you can't? Is it for an art class? somebody ask for a commission and say and please only illustrate it standing up Ah, uh, got yourself a table for standing up, like a standing desk kind of deal. Yeah, it's a toughie then because, yeah, you've got yourself a situation where the the place that you've chosen or that you've gotten a, a desk to work on and discovered that, oh, it's not fun to draw standing up at this desk, although even though it's supposed to be better for our backs and whatever and our health. Um, I feel like that's something you can, I mean, I have drawn standing up and it wasn't the most natural thing in the entire world, but it, it was something I was able to pull off. It, maybe that's something where just like with enough practice and time, hopefully. Oh, how I could draw equally good lines from left to the right side. Yeah, that's something that, I mean, I you're noticing that, I'm sure you're noticing, I'm, I'm turning the paper a lot. Because there's, there's certain directions, like pulling towards me feels like more naturally. 
or more natural to me. Especially when I used to work with Crow Quill, I really preferred to pull towards me when I was inking, so I was always turning the page around. But yeah, I, I've I've practiced using this tool for a long time now, and uh, I feel like I'm finally getting the hang of how it works. I I should let me qualify that statement. I feel like it. <laughs> okay, I know that there's like leveling up I have yet to do with this tool. But it's starting to feel like it's I can do it, get it to do most of what I want it to do. When I first started using the brush pen, and this was like going on actually literally a decade ago, it was, it was 2011 when I first started messing around with using brush pens. Um, it really felt like it was this wild, out of control device that I just couldn't make it do anything that I wanted it to do. And I'm like, I think it's going to do this. And it didn't do that at all. But yeah, I've been drawing with it a lot since then. I've learned a little bit of what to expect from it, but still, the surprises happen. I try to remind myself that's part of the fun of this business. Working with the unexpected. Okay, now for some dry brush work. What I do for that is break out a little extra piece of watercolor paper. I just scrub around a little bit and then do I'm just hardly touching the paper right now. That's another one that took me a long time to get used to with this tool. Because I used, like I said, I, my my tool of choice before this for inking was the uh, Crow Quill. It was a Hunts 102 that I used. I still have a bunch. Um, and the thing about that was I was able to like get a lot of control, and then I would move my hand ever so carefully, and I'm like really pressing into the paper. And so doing this kind of like fast really light work did not come easy or natural. And I don't always nail it. Well, thank you, Powan Fifteen FE. I hope I'm saying that right. Or is it? I'm not sure how I'm supposed to pronounce that. Is the one as the one in the five representing letters of some sort? Okay. Oh, just Pawan. Okay. I will just say Pawan. Thank you for being here today. A 
let's get some shading on All right, starting to look like a bridge. Oops, get some. There we go. I'm gonna go all out on this tree. I'm gonna just block it in, try to get some texture and shade on it. I don't know if I'm gonna pull it off. We'll see. Oh, and my name? Well, my name is right above me. It's Jersey Drozd. And my socials are up there, too. Actually, the thing I've been trying to point people at is the rss.jdrozd.com, which is the URL that takes you to everything that I make. And as a matter of fact, um, I'm also starting up a monthly newsletter where I'm going to collect all of the stuff I make every month because I do comics i do live streams i do illustrations i do podcasts i make a lot of things and i don't make it easy for people to find them so but for now yes rss.jdros.com is the place to see everything that i produce on a regular basis whether it's drawings like this or podcasts about drawing I think I'm ready to start the explosion. <laughs> I, I felt the, the urge to hit save. It's saved. It's saved, Jersey. It's okay. Funny thing about real life, it auto saves for you. Explosion time. Paper. Work with me here.
do it this way. One of the things I like about drawing these kinds of explosions is thinking about the physics of the of the smoke and the fire and like how it would wrap around things and like what what direction it would travel given the the point of impact and the force that it'd be causing. I mean, I am not going to say that I'm terribly scientific about it or that like I'm sure if a physicist came in and said like guess what? Here's all the ways you did it wrong, I'd be like, "Yep, probably." Um but it is it's a fun thing to think about and and like sort of play with the lines to get them to conform to what I think would be happening there. Come on. Oh, do I draw from reference? Um, yes, indeed, all the time. This bridge was referenced for sure. I don't have this in my head. I should black more of that in. This is something that I feel like I didn't understand as a young artist. And when I'm, and I, I teach classes too, so I work with a lot of young artists. I remember thinking that real artists can just draw everything out of their own heads. Now, there's two problems with that. One is our head can only hold so much. So I can draw from my imagination for sure. But I don't have every image that I've ever seen. Well, I don't have photographic memory. Two is not every artist can draw from their imagination. Some have, Some are very good at drawing what they see. I am not. So like in like when I took art classes and they did still life, man, I sucked at still life. But I had friends who were really awesome at it. I think that's like probably one of the most one of the very important things I think we can learn in, as artists is that uh, everybody's different, <laughs> and that these rules that we get really hung up on. Uh, your mileage may vary. But yes, I draw from reference and I have a, um, when I was first starting out back before, I've, I've been doing this long enough that I didn't use computers when I first started. Um, I had actually a gigantic binder of things that I photocopied or printed out, um, mostly photocopied. I would like go to the library and get like reference books about whatever subject. So like I did a book, I did a comic in 1998. No, it was like 2000. It was 2000. Um, and I had to have a certain kind of Japanese fishing boat in it. So I went to the local library, looked up books about that, those kinds of boats, photocopied a bunch of images and put them into my binder. Nowadays I use things like Pinterest and whatnot to like ca gather images for reference for books. And when I work with certain writers, like, so Dan Michigan is a writer I've worked with before. We worked on the Warren Commission report together, and he is fabulous at actually providing reference in his scripts. So it may be like panel two, we see the triple underpass in, in Dealey Plaza, um, and he actually send me like three or four images with it. Ah, you're in college, it's difficult to find time to draw. I, I hear that, and I feel you. Because college is tough. It is super demanding. And you're probably tired a lot. I remember it being pretty tough when I was in college. Even subjects I was really wild about. It was it was really demanding. So finding time to draw is a toughie. And then like showing up with like a like energy. Oh, 
Oh, hey, Reed Fisher. No, I, yeah, that's the thing. I, I think that we get we get hung up on these stories about like what what we think we see other people doing things, and we're like, okay, well, it looks so effortless and easy. Why is it so hard for me? I think it's 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 a hard thing to keep in mind is that like everybody's got a, a different approach, a different style. And then here's where it gets extra tricky is when how do you know you're not making excuses for yourself, right? Cuz I've also done that. Well, I just work this way, that's all. And I'm like arguing my to talk myself out of trying something really challenging. But for the most part, I try to just remember that, you know, it's like what works for somebody else may or may not work for me. Yeah, it it, it looks I mean, when you see a really beautiful piece of art, especially when you see somebody like so like what you missed out on um, with this is you didn't see me working out all the different angles of perspective, try to figure out what's the right composition, how many times I messed with this. Because actually, if you want to know the truth, I think um, Baron von Baer's staff here is actually out of proportion. It's way too long. We wouldn't actually see this part of the staff. It would be concealed by him. I think I, I goofed the perspective on that. But also, like all the ways I like messed with the composition to make sure that there was, wasn't any tangents and so that everything, like the negative space was handled properly. You missed all of that work that I did. So you're just watching me ink now. So that, yeah, this looks like, man, he's just, he knows exactly what he's doing. He doesn't have to think about it. Well, I did all the thinking earlier. And this is something I talk about with my students all the time is like, I chunk my process out to, you know, doing like really rough thumbnail, second round of rough thumbnail, and then pencils. And then because each, each stage you're thinking about different things. So at like really rough thumbnail, I'm thinking about initial composition, general sense of spatial relationships. And then at second round thumbnails, I start working out the, the, the gesture, the body language, the fabric folds, things like that. Hey, Tom. But then when I get to final penciling, then yeah, then I'm just making sure that it looks okay. And now what I'm worried about is like this sense of texture and line value. All that other thinking has been done. So yeah, it, it that chunking is what makes it look easy because I've isolated all the different parts um, into like little realms of concern, if that makes sense. Try to be generous to myself and not like try to break my brain by taking on too much at the same time. Yeah, <laughs> yes, Tom, I'm drawing explosions today. I've been doing a lot of different kinds of thought experiments with these characters, and I'm actually starting a brand new online course today with with uh, middle schoolers and one of the things we're going to be doing is learning about our characters by drawing them interacting with things and each other and that's what i've been doing for the past like month now right with all these different experiments like this one where i drew the characters walking through basically like a combination of uh, ancient mayan civilization and black hand gorge here in ohio and then i drew them around a campfire and i drew them you know, but now for for today's, I thought, okay, let's do one where they're we're actually doing an action thing, like action action is in like what would you say, Arnold Schwarzenegger movie action. And what am I learning when I do that? Well, I'm learning how they all react differently to the danger. And I have this essentially expressionless bear. How can I play with his body language to show how he feels? 
I don't know if I'm always hitting it. Actually, that's why it's called an experiment, because I'm learning. I'm learning about my characters as I go. It's another thing I tell my students is like, you know, it's, they're like, oh, I got this great idea for a book. I'm like, well, write the book. And they're like, well, let me start with the cover. I'm like, well, why would you start with a cover? Because the, the act of writing the book is going to reveal to you what the book's about. Well, how could you make a preview image for a thing that you don't fully understand yet? Give yourself the opportunity to learn about it. I know that sounds kind of woo-woo. Okay, can I make out what the heck's going on there? I have I have the pencils that I did digitally uh, open next to me so I can zoom in on things and see what I was intending to do there because <laughs> I am not, I, my, my vision is not what it used to be and I am having a devil of a time seeing what's going on here. Okay, okay, that's Pickle's scarf there. That's her other foot and her head there. Don't get me wrong. I love drawing explosions. I love drawing explosions and I love drawing debris. Largely because, I mean, you just get to like play around with line when you do that. It's just, it's just fun to draw that way. So I don't know. I, don't, I was thinking about trying to shade Pickles and Taft here. Dare I? There we go. That's the way I want to do it. I'll be really soft. I'm also going to do this with color. Oh, so, Pawan, you, you're struggling with the fact that, like, you have too many interests, it sounds like? Yeah, that's... I don't know. I feel like that's a good problem to have. But, I mean, that I don't, not to diminish the struggle, because it is a struggle indeed. Because I feel like all these things can build upon and support one another. I think, because like one of the things I talk about in my comics class is that images have a rhythm, right? Like if you, for instance, if I were to say, I have to draw this real quick. If I were to take right, so I, I write this line of dialogue, right? And then I write this. You can hear how the rhythm is different, right? And comics panels work that way. The amount of information you put in the panels, like how many people, how many images you put per panel, um, that all adds up to a, a type of rhythm. So understanding how music works helps you understand how visual rhythms work. Understanding how visual rhythms work will help reinforce like your your comprehension of how musical rhythms work. Having all those interests 
feeds different learning styles, right? So I I have a I'm 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 really not awesome at music. Um, I'm actually kind of super bad at music, but um, I do have other interests, right? Um, and I feel like it's something I try to, to do is be patient with myself about it and listen to what my body's telling me, what my, for lack of a better term, what my heart is telling me. There's another thing going back to like when I was a young artist is I used to think, I think this is very, this feels very appropriate to the age that I, that I was is I felt like I can only be a cartoonist and that's it. That's, that's who I am. That's the long and short of me. I am a cartoonist. And as a matter of fact, back then I said, I'm a penciler. I didn't even, I didn't work. I refused to work with ink. Cause I said, I'm a penciler. All I think about is structure, composition, energy and flow, but I don't think about line value. That's not my job. That's somebody else's job. And you get so hung up on this idea of your identity as an artist. What's my style? Who am I as an artist? What am I trying to say? Right. And the thing is, is like, and this would, this would have been very hard for me to hear when I was like 22. That isn't all who you are. It's more to you than that. And that's not what makes you valuable. Oh yeah, yeah, Tom. That's a good point about uh, rhythm too. Rhythm is is in the grammar as well, isn't it? So anyway, like that's all. To, that's all to support this idea that if you have lots of interests, it's you know you can you can follow that muse and go where it takes you. And you know, I would say photography would support your understanding of visual, you know, visuals in terms of drawing. I just know that like when I was when I was a younger person, I, I really did struggle with that a lot. I, I was so I was so um, I felt it was it was so crucial that I established my identity as an artist and I am the person who can give you this. And I, I think that's there's there's like a certain truth to that in terms of like how do you market yourself as an artist? I'm an artist who does these things for these people, but the danger is is listening and buying into that narrative for yourself. And thinking that somehow, well, as somebody who teaches, this is something I get every once in a while from people. It's like, oh, well, you know, those who can't teach, you know, I guess you're not a cartoonist after all. You're just a cartooning teacher. Okay. You could have that. That's yours. Because I think there's something profoundly dangerous about putting all of our, and Tom will understand this metaphor, putting all of our chips on uh, one identity as being the only, the only data point on who you are as a person. How am I doing on time? I have been going for 45 minutes and I am almost done. So, yep, I'm going to, this one's going to take me just about an hour. Anybody who's been showing up to a lot of these live streams has heard me do, always like checking the clock because, yeah, another part of the experiment that I'm running is to see how long it takes me to do these illustrations. Because the different styles I work in are partially informed by that non renewable resource of time. Part of the deciding factor of what tools I use comes from, or like a, a criteria that I consider when choosing tools is how long will it take me using that tool? Do I like the way it looks? Do I enjoy using that tool? And how long does it take?
I think that's true, Tom. Is like the, yes, that is part of the the criteria that you have to consider is the, whether or not this is going to be something that you do just for pleasure, or is something you're to try to turn into a job. I'm saving the lightning for the end because I think that's going to be really a, a satisfying line to draw. Barely anything? Did I miss anything? Just the mountain range. Let's do that mountain range with a nice thin line, and then I'm going to do that lightning bolt. And I think I'm going to come in. 10 minutes early. Oops. Let's back away so we can get more of the view of how this thing's coming together. There we are so far. To build on that idea, Tom, a little bit, I would also say, like, you know, something I I was kind of saying earlier about, like, how these, these things can inform one another is that, man, I just so want a hobby. I want a hobby really bad because I have made this part of this comics business so much of my life that I actually would very much like to learn a musical instrument. And making the time for that is not always easy. And so, like, that's, I think, something I've, I've come to grips with is, like, the idea of, like, I used to, th speaking only for myself, I always thought when I was a young person that a hobby was something you do when you have nothing else to do. <laughs> it's something you do to pass the time. And, you know what? A hobby can be... Like, I, I, I understand that I'm coming to this very late. Uh, it could be something you do because it enriches you. Oh, my gosh. How about that? How about you do things? Because it actually makes you have a richer experience of life. Who knew that you could do that? <laughs> I, oh, my gosh. I, I've got some serious baggage when it comes to um, productivity and hard work and I, I spent a, a lot of energy on building that aspect of my, my, my identity and whatever you would call it, personal brand and whatnot. Okay. I think it's time to draw the lightning. Yeah, so this, this, this bear, actually, um, do I have a copy? I need to put this back in my online store. I actually have a mini comic about this bear. This is my first pass at uh, a story about him. And um, it's screen printed cover, which also I need to redo because I think the brown came out a little bit too, too, too much the same value as the background. Anyway, the premise is, is that, you know, like in stories where um, in heroic mythology, the heroes get some kind of gift or boon from the gods, the magic or whatever. It's like, but it becomes like this, it's a powerful talisman or weapon, like the head of Medusa. Perseus uses the head of Medusa to destroy the Kraken. 
And then I thought as a kid, like, what does he do with the head when he's done? You know, let's, w- w- what happens after that? Like, does he keep it in the, the cave? Does he put it in a closet? What happens if his kids open the closet and find the Medusa head? Oh, your kids are stoned now. So Baron Von Baer is the person that you take those objects to. He takes the, you, you give the cursed object to him. He puts it in a safe place. He's got to keep kind of like at the end of the Indiana Jones movie, right? Um, and so it's a story of how he comes across different cursed objects and removes the curses on them with the help of these little four little ghosts who live in his staff. You can see the staff design was different back then. This is like from, I want to say, two years ago. And so each one of these little ghosts has a different magical talent. And so Orange has strength and, uh, you know, I forget what all the different... I have, it, I have it all written down. I wrote it down in a book so I didn't have to remember it. Violet is speed and cleverness. Blue is, uh, I think, time and gravity. And green is wisdom and health. Is it gravity? I can't remember what, what blue does. I have it written down in a notebook. Well, yes, Perseus did... Uh, Perseus did put it in a bag... And then, oh, it got put on Athena's shield. There's what happened to it. So, okay, question answered. But it be, that, that question became the catalyst for coming up with this story idea of this cute little bear who is sort of like uh, a Doctor Strange kind of like mystical character. So the log line I use is it's uh, Doctor Strange meets Hello Kitty. I became obsessed with this idea of like, can you do like really spooky, creepy stuff, but with super cute characters? Because I love drawing, like, so my favorite thing to draw is cute things being brave. But I also really love like monster movies and spooky horror movies. So I was trying, it's just me trying to mix both those things together. That's the, that's the idea behind this whole thing. So I'm continuing to play with ideas with it. If it produces heads on Athena's shield, then game over if Athena fights anybody. Like the ultimate power up. All right, I think, I think it's done. I think the inks are finished. Yeah, Reed Fitcher, you got it exactly right. Yeah, like I, I, that maybe that's a better description is like John Constantine slash Indiana Jones because the Baron himself doesn't actually have any magic. Um, his magic comes through the people who help him, right? So there's that aspect too, which I, I'm, a, I'm a total sucker for. So the wisps are what give him the, you know, the magical edge, and then of course he needs the help of other kinds of adventurers too, people who have more skills in fighting. His his skill is knowledge. So hopefully I'll get to make a book out of it. I mean, I have. I mean, I got this one that I'll have to like try to see how many copies I have left and put it up for sale. I need to print more covers, and it's uh, this is a five color cover. One, two, three, four. The four or five? I think it's five. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, it's a five color cover. This was kind of a, a beast to print and get it to line up right. Um, but I'll let everybody know when this is available again. So, okay, so there's this, this is done. So now the next step will be is I'm probably going to either digitally or analog paint it on Thursday. So the the next stream will be at Thursday. Uh, What day is that? 
here's the part of the, the stream where I always have to look at the calendar to find out what the heck day is going to be. 25th, Thursday the 25th at 10 a.m. Eastern Time, 9 a.m. Central, 7 a.m. Pacific. And I'm going to take this to the next stage where I color it in some way. And I've been doing digital and analog um, coloring comparisons to see which works best for me. This is the part where I also say, hey, if you enjoyed this, please consider hitting like on the video. That helps more people find this. I won't lie. I'm trying to build an audience around this thing because I've got projects coming up this year that I really want to let people know about. Also, on that point, I have a, uh, a newsletter that I'm launching where I'm going to collect monthly all the stuff that I do. Uh, and that's at jdros.com slash newsletter. And I'm going to be sending out sort of little messages about thoughts on creativity, the stuff I talk about here, but then also like collecting like everything I made that month so that, you know, you'll have a single place to look instead of following me on various social medias. So, okay. Thanks everybody uh, for hanging out with me and talking about creativity and drawing and storytelling with me. And until next time on Thursday, I have been Jersey Droz, jdroz.com, uh, rss.jdroz.com for everything I make. Okay, bye.